This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Shireen Thor about impactful executive coaching for successful organizational leadership. Shereen Thor, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you um, virtually uh, <laughs> in person today. Uh, it's, you know, we as we've been preparing for this episode, it's been fun to get to learn a little bit about you, and I'm excited to have a, a meaningful discussion today about executive coaching, how to do that impactfully, and how we can coach others to drive successful organizational leadership within our teams, within our organizations. As we get started, I just wanted to share Shireen's bio with everyone. Shireen Thor is an executive coach and the founder of Awaken the Rebel, a professional coaching company that takes on, uh, that takes an out of the box approach to leadership. She has been featured on Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, Insider, Medium, Spike TV, 97.1 AMP Radio, and many other publications. Shireen is a certified professional coach holds a bachelor's degree in human communication studies, and she is certified in meditation as well. She hosts the Awaken the Rebel podcast and is currently writing a book for women in leadership entitled Revolutionary Women. I think that is awesome. I love, Thank you. I love the idea of revolutionary women. I love the whole idea around Awaken the Rebel. Uh, we need more rebels in our life, I think. Um, <laughs> So I'm super excited to learn more about this and how you got into doing what you're doing. Um, As we get started, anything you would like to share uh, by way of background, personal context for us? You know, it's so funny that you say you love the rebel thing and the revolutionary thing because I looked at your LinkedIn and I was like, man, he's so together. Like he just looks like this very together, successful guy. And I was worried that I would be like too rebelly or too out of the box or too atypical. And I guess in terms of what I would want to say in terms of background, it's like, that's actually always been my fear in corporate as well, that I am too weird, that I don't fit. And I think, I think what's happening is that there actually is like an interesting shift. You know, I think for myself personally on my path, I needed to rebel against the nine to five and nine to five to try to live this extraordinary life. But ultimately everything I learned when brought back into the corporate setting was really, really impactful for them. And so clearly, even within my own identity, I'm like still healing that part of me that feels like I don't fit. <laughs> but it's exciting to know that you're into it. And that's kind of the response I'm getting in corporations as well, is that they are also coming to this place of realizing you can't really separate the task um, of actually running a successful organization from the human who is doing the work and moving that mission forward. So I'm into it. I'm excited about this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Thank you. And that's, that's fun to hear your perspective as, as you're looking over like my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> um, that's actually a concern I have because I feel like I'm quite the nonconformist. Um, and, it, you know, but I, I, I realize that's kind of the vibe I put off. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm, I'm like a middle-aged white straight guy, right? And so I just like, I check all the boxes of normal and, yes. and, uh, and people, you know, take a look, but, but, uh, uh, I'm, I'm like an onion, you know, you peel back the layers. Oh yeah. There's more there. We I all can are. See that. We My all goodness. are, right? <laughs> um, 
Yes, but no, that's it, true. It's but gonna it's be fun. it's gonna be fun. Yeah. <laughs> It's fun to know that you have that nonconformist side. Like maybe that's not your brand, right? Like you're not putting it out there all crazy on LinkedIn, but secretly, guys, Jonathan's a rebel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so let's start there. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Awaken the Rebel. Um, what is it? How did how did you get started with it? Um, and and then maybe a little bit about revolutionary women and what you're okay. trying to accomplish there. Yeah, definitely. So Awaken the Rebel is really the inception of everything. I am a first generation American, meaning my mom and dad immigrated here and then I was born here in America. And so it was very, very clear that the expectation was you are to become a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, or you will be viewed as a failure. And so the first rebel move, my first Awaken the Rebel moment was to say, no, I don't want to do that. I know that's what you guys want from me. That does not feel like the right path for me. And so while that's what maybe worked for you to thrive in Egypt, or maybe that's what worked for you as an immigrant to survive here in a new country, I have to operate under my own code. And my code says, I just have to do some weird stuff. <laughs> so I quit a master's degree and I started doing stand-up comedy. And I just really went down this crazy path that was completely unacceptable in my mother's eyes. <laughs> it was like a full-on embarrassment. Um, but what ultimately happened was, I started to learn about who I was. I started to self-actualize, which I think a lot of people don't do, which is, I think, why midlife crises happen. Crises, crises, there you go. <laughs> um, so basically, I ended up falling in love with coaching. Honestly, coaching was what helped me sort of pull off that mask of what other people wanted me to be versus what I truly was. And I fell in love with the art. And so I've been coaching for over a decade. I've been really building Awaken the Rebel for the last uh, six years more seriously. And so the idea of Awaken the Rebel is essentially to rebel against other people's expectations and say yes to your soul's higher calling. That's like the beginning. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's so important for us to be authentic and true to who we are and build upon our strengths and our own unique talents. And that's, you know, it's just different for everyone. There's no like unique, uh, it, there are unique paths for everyone. There's no um, universal uh, linear path for people. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to kind of find their own way. And that does fly in the face of a lot of the social norms that are out there in, in terms of how we define success mm -hmm. uh, in various walks of life. And so it's, it's also funny, like as you were saying at the beginning, you know, with my LinkedIn, you know, I've, I've had a fair amount of career success. Um, but on the one hand, you know, I, I, I have success there. On the other hand, I'm kind of the black sheep of my family because, you know, I, I've defied expectations and done different types of things, you know, that people thought were, were, you know, normal or expected yeah. or whatever. And so, you know, we, so many of us have to deal with those types of things and just yeah. be willing to, you know, be a little courageous and, and challenge those norms. What did they expect of you that you rebelled against? Like, what do they think you should be doing? And you were like, no, I'm going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a variety of things. Um, you know, part of it is I, I just come from a very religious, very conservative family. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, in many ways, I'm quite liberal. I, I would say overall, I'm, I'm fairly moderate, um, but definitely left leaning on social issues. Um, and Anyways, that, that is a big no-no. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you're so crazy, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big no-no. Um, I, I, I consider myself a spiritual and religious person, but certainly not to the level of ideology or dogma, you know, as my yeah. family. So that's a big no-no. Um, you know, most of my family is in education or like social work or, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they do counseling, those sorts of things. And then I went the, the path of, of, uh, of corporate type stuff and business, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so that's a little different. So, you know, there's just all these things and that's yeah. my, that's my context. I mean, your, your context is a first gen, uh, immigrant in the country and mm -hmm. trying to carve your own path. You've obviously had different challenges than I've had, but, mm -hmm. um, but we all have, you know, we all have to carve out our own path, that's our right. own journey. Yeah. And we all have some sort of set of expectations or social norms that have been projected onto us by our family, friends, culture, environment, whatever. And I do think it's everyone's, you know, if they want to be fulfilled in this life, it's everyone's sort of personal duty to do the work of looking inwards, like, what do I actually want? 
Why do I actually want it? Am I going to have the courage to follow my own path versus just getting that check or that stamp of approval from the people around me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that is hard. And I, I agree with you that I think that is why a lot of midlife crises happen because, you know, we, we you know, let's, let's say we go on the education path. Of, mm -hmm. Actually, now that I'm saying it, I think it's funny because my kids like the game of life like the old board game, right? right? And you, you, you get to a certain part early in the game where you have to choose, are you going to do a career path or an education path? And depending on which you choose, you go in different directions and you do different oh. types of things, right? And, you know, that's actually kind of how it is, right? We, we make those types of decisions um, as young adults that have, you mm -hmm. know, big impact. And so many people decide they're going to go on the education path why? Because people tell them they should. Um, because yeah. that's what society sh deems, you know, as appropriate and, and what successful people do. Mm -hmm. um, and if someone chooses something else, you know, they get a lot of judgment, you know, often. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I think those are the types of things we're always grappling with. And right. I just, I just remember as a, as a young college student, I switched majors a bunch of times trying to figure out what I like and what, you know, I was good at. And, what I would find fulfillment in. And, mm -hmm. and those aren't necessarily the same things. Like there are things I'm good yeah. at, uh, things that, you know, that I could do that would provide for me and my family that would give me a successful career, but it's not something I find meaning in. And so it's not something I would want to do. And mm -hmm. luckily I was able to figure that out as a college student. So I didn't end up spending 10, 20 years in a career I hate. But yeah. I think a lot of people, you know, end up getting into something simply because, it's what they're good at and because everyone they're getting all this constant reinforcement about that's, totally. that's what life success a successful life looks like and then they find themselves in their 40s they hate what they do mm -hmm. um, they don't find meaning and purpose in their work and then they they at that point you know they either after years or decades of the grind they mm -hmm. decide they need to do something different uh or whatever and and so we find people you know, at that point who are rebelling and, and doing all yes. sorts of interesting things, uh, <laughs> right. you know, so, yeah, and, and maybe, maybe that's where your, your book comes in. Uh, maybe not, but tell us a little bit more about what you're working on, um, with women in leadership, the revolutionary woman. Yeah. So, okay. So my first sort of introduction into doing more corporate coaching was I was working with the executive director of a really large nonprofit and her main team of associate directors. There was three of them, so four in total. And I just was going on my gut in this sort of, um, it, was like a it was like a leadership retreat they were doing. It was four hours and I was called in to co-facilitate. And I asked them this question because one of their main issues was that they were so stressed out. They were all so overworked and so stressed out, but they were doing beautiful work in the community. And so they didn't feel like they had permission to slow down or have healthy work-life balance because it was about, you know, like saving the children. And so it was like really easy to work themselves into the ground. And so I asked them this question and I said, so when you get to the end of your life, like let's say you've lived a hundred years and you pass away, when you get into heaven and you actually look back on your life retroactively, what are you going to be the most proud of? And so my sort of rebel world, right, where I'm get, helping people get into their soul and really think deep and really um, have big picture thinking about what truly matters to them in terms of how they're going to lead their life that message that I didn't think fit in corporate, this was the first time I really realized, oh, they really actually need this. They really actually need to be thinking deliberately about who they are and how they are in the world, apart from their work that they're doing in the world. What's really going to matter to them when they pass? And so once this dropped for them and they all got like this amazing deep perspective about what they truly wanted, it was really easy for me to then coach them and move forward. I coached them for like a course of like two years and then they had me coaching like 16 of their managers and it was just a whole thing. Um, but that was my introduction into the corporate world realizing, oh, people really need this and particularly women in leadership. Because what I find with women is that they burn the candle at both ends and they don't think it's okay to take up space or rest or relax or calm down. It's like, 
and I, and I know men do this too, but the thing is, and this might sound totally sexist and I'm just going to do it because I'm the crazy rebel girl. So I give myself permission to say the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, men, when they have like adrenaline and cortisol and stress, it actually tends to like work in their favor. And they, I was in this weight loss program once and he, and the guy told me, don't weigh yourself, don't weigh yourself. And I was like, well, why? And he's like, well, well, stress works differently for men and women. Men get stressed when they see the number on the scale and it makes them work harder. Women get stressed and the cortisol makes them uh, gain weight around their belly. They like, get more, it causes problems for them. And so I think men and women operate differently. This is certainly not across the board. I want men to also be de-stressed. <laughs> But I feel like for women, we, we don't quite realize how toxic it is for us to operate in this way. We also live in very much a man's world. And so we're just trying to like keep up with the Joneses, right? Like we want to be as high performing as the men are. We want to do it the way that, but the truth is when a woman slows down and can actually get into her zone of genius and follow her intuition, she can lead tremendously not by being so aggressive and going fast and going hard, but by actually just kind of calming down and slowing down and being in tune with her inner guidance. And so I just find that women in leadership, I think are often trying to do it the man's way and it's hurting them physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. I find a lot of women who are super successful have tremendous trouble in their marriages. I find um, the women who are trying to do well in corporate, but also struggling to express themselves, struggling to speak up at meetings, struggling to like be the authentic truth of themselves in the workplace. And so I just wanted to really focus on women, women in leadership and support them in bringing this idea of, I guess, empowerment and self-care in the same thread to support them in leading powerfully. Yeah, I, I like that. I think leading powerfully requires us to be centered mm -hmm. with ourselves, right? So it's, it's interesting because we often hear about how leaders need to know their people in order to lead effectively, right? And that's true. Mm -hmm. I, I can't lead if I don't know the unique motivations and the priorities of my people. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't create the type of environment where they're going to find their motivation, their meaning, and their purpose. Mm -hmm. but I also, I can't really understand or know others unless I know myself first because, exactly. because we end up just projecting all this garbage. And if, <laughs> if I don't know enough about myself and my, how my own inner workings, you know, work and, and how yeah. I, how I make sense of the world, if I don't understand that, then I'm never going to actually see the people that I'm working with That's in right. their true, in their true form. I'm constantly going to be projecting onto them all of my own biases, all my own prejudices, all my own whatever, all my garbage. And, and I'm not going to be able to see them truly for who they are and what they bring mm -hmm. to the table. Um, so I need to know myself first. That means I have to practice self-care. I have to practice mindfulness. I need to take time to self-reflect. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a process. Like it's, it's not something I can do overnight. Mm -hmm. So I need to get into the habit of, of doing those types of things that will allow me to, to better understand who I am, what drives me, um, why I'm driven by those things, why I pro prioritize things the way I do. Mm -hmm. And over time, it, it becomes iterative. Over time, I'll, that will allow me then to better understand the people I, I work with and serve and lead, um, which will then allow me to better understand myself. And it's, it's cyclical. Mm -hmm. um, but so often, leaders, you know, they, they get promoted because they're successful. They find themselves in a positions of power and authority yeah. and they think they think that means they have it all figured out mm -hmm. and so and then they start to project their garbage onto everybody and then they <laughs> right. wonder then they wonder why isn't this working um right. and it's because no you don't have it all figured out you might have yeah. been really good you might have been a really good salesperson but that doesn't mean you're going to be a good sales manager um That's right. you know and and so we're constantly dealing with mm -hmm. with that kind of stuff I think that's so true. You know, like you said, someone might be promoted because they were an amazing attorney, right? Like they did, they did a great job at being an attorney and now they are like, you know, like the chief compliance officer and it's more about them overseeing. 
and it's just a totally different skill set. And I think you're right. I think some people go, oh, I've been promoted. I have it figured out. Let me just now go just be who I am and do what I do. And the teams just start to fall apart because I feel like the most impactful thing a leader can do is exactly what you said, that self-actualization. And it's almost like instead of outputting information to your team, you're actually, you want to take the time to reflect and empty yourself out so that you are open and available for what the team needs because they're going to do their job well. And it's your job to empower, to delegate, to support them. And I think ultimately what leaders need to be the most effective in doing these things is really up leveling and upgrading their mindset so that they aren't projecting the garbage. Like you said, it's just so important. So it's literally like you as a leader, it's actually your job to develop personally more than it is for you to do a job. Like you're now you're not an attorney anymore. It's not your job to do that job. It's actually now your job to develop personally so that you can lead effectively. And I feel like oftentimes that piece is missing. Like you said, they think, oh, I've been promoted. I've got it figured out. I'm going to now go do my thing. And it just doesn't work. And so I think that's why you see people hiring coaches at that higher level for that reason, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So many people find themselves in, in leadership positions within organizations with really not much management or leadership training. Uh, they just risen up the hierarchy for, you know, whatever reason they probably have, you know, significant skills that they bring to the Mm -hmm. table for sure, but it is a different skill set. And, you know, as, as I, as I think about, um, something you just said, you know, in terms of emptying yourself out in terms of making yourself accessible and available to your people. Um, it's so vital uh, to be able to do that. And that's frankly, not what a lot of leaders are trained to do or what they've mm-hmm. experienced in the past, what they've seen yeah. modeled for them. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you have to recognize that once you move into the leadership role, yes, you have some level of expertise. That's important. Um, mm-hmm. But really now you are relying on the experts below you. So you empower yes. them, you lean on them and their expertise mm-hmm. rather, rather than trying to force feed yourself into, exactly. into the, the situation and micromanage everything. And that's mm-hmm. what a lot of leaders end up doing. Um, or they end yeah. up running around trying to put out fires constantly, trying to insert themselves into right. all these different decisions where, where they're just not needed. If you trust your people, if you right. empower your people, and you lean on their expertise, mm-hmm. then, then, you know, you, you lift each other, every, the whole yeah. team builds and lifts each other. And that in, in includes you as the leader that makes you look good because mm-hmm. your people are doing a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's counterintuitive because you're totally. letting, you're letting go of control. Exactly. You're giving away power. You're, you're trusting in your people. <laughs> right. And, and as you do that, um, inevitably, you know, there are things that can happen that yeah. you may not have been prepared for, yeah. but you know what? That happens anyways. That has happened anyways. You, it, it, you can't control you. It's, it's a myth. It's, it's not true. You cannot mm-hmm. control everything. And just because you have your finger in everyone's business mm-hmm. doesn't mean you're actually going to control it and be able to stay on top of everything. And in fact, the opposite's mm-hmm. true. You will run yourself into the ground you will wear yourself out. And so you have to be mindful of your own self-care if you want to be there to empower your people. It's simply impossible to have a thriving um, team or a a thriving organization of empowered individuals all tapping into their own intrinsic motivators, um, finding their passions, their meaning and work. It's impossible for that to happen if I can't trust my people, Mm -hmm. if I'm constantly micromanaging and if I'm just running around trying to put out fires all the time, most yeah. of which are probably fires of my own making because, yeah. because of the dynamic that I've created and the unhealthy kind of environment within my team. Mm-hmm. That is such a good point. And I feel like to your point, I feel like ego is a big thing. And I think that's why personal development might be key is you kind of need to, like, the, like you said, the skills that got you to this promotion are not going to be the skills that help you thrive in this place. In the same way that, you know, the skills that got my parents here, like surviving here as immigrants, weren't going to be the same skills that were going to allow me to thrive as an actual American born girl. You know, it's just, it is what it is. It's just the, the evolution of life. But um, I feel like a lot of the work that's needed is to kind of unravel your ego 
It's not really about you anymore. It's actually about them. They're the ones doing the work and you need to tune into what they need. You can only tune into what they need if you, in your life, tune into what you need and give yourself what you need in your own time. And um, one of the best books I've read actually is this Conscious Business by Fred Kaufman. I'm being a nerd and holding it up for him just uh, for the listeners who are wondering why my voice changed into a total cheesy creep girl. (laughs) Um, And it's just so good. And I want to actually read, if it's okay with you to be a weirdo right now and read, uh, there are 12 questions. And basically researchers found that exceptional managers created a workplace where the employees emphatically answered yes when asked these 12 questions. And just to give context to that, one of the things that research has said is the thing that will make people stay at their job and do a good job long-term is the manager. So that's why they're kind of focusing on like, how is the manager making these employees feel? So, so for those of you who are listening, think about these questions, especially if you manage, okay? So the first question is, do I know what is expected of me at work? Second question is, do I have the materials and equipment I need to do my work right? Third question is, at work, do I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day? Fourth question, in the last seven days, have I received recognition or praise for doing good work? Fifth question, does my supervisor or someone at work seem to care about me as a person? Sixth question, is there someone at work who encourages my development? Seven, at work, do my opinions seem to count? Eight, does the mission or purpose of my company make me feel like my job is important? Nine, are my coworkers committed to doing quality work? 10, do I have a best friend at work? 11, in the last six months, has someone at work talked to me about my progress? And 12, this last year, have I had opportunities at work to learn and grow? And so you can kind of see from these questions, it's like not really about the task at hand so much as do I have a best friend at work? Have I gotten recognition in the last seven days? Do I have what I need to do my job? Is this purpose in alignment with what makes me feel important or valuable in the world? And so I I kind of love the shift in corporate that's changing from it's just all about the task, do, do, do to, you know, Google and these kind of Silicon Valley companies who understand human capital is a thing. Human beings are the ones running your companies. And so let's actually invest in them versus just getting as much as we can out of them. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I love that list of, of factors that drive employee engagement in the workplace. And it's, it's so important. And we as leaders can do a lot to, to help create that dynamic, that environment. Mm-hmm. Shireen, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. The time has flown by. We're about out of time. Uh, and perhaps I can have you back again at a future date so we can continue the conversation. Because frankly, you're a lot of fun to chat with. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. I'd love to come back. Yeah, this has been fun. Uh, but before we, we end today, I did want to give you a chance to give the last word and share with listeners how they can get connected with you and find out more about what you're doing. So I have this beautiful website, awakentherebel.com, and I've compiled some of the research-based items that actually make people thrive and have a healthy well-being. I took a class at Yale and sort of synthesized everything into this little happiness cheat sheet. So definitely find me at awakentherebel.com, check out the happiness cheat sheet, and hopefully I can support you in living that amazing life that will help you rest in peace, not to be the morbid girl, but it's really what I care about. (laughs) Excellent. Well, thank you again so much. It's really been a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. And I hope listeners will take you up on that, reach out, get connected, find out more about what Shereen can do for, for all of you who are listening. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think.
Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.